So unfortunately, we have to talk about SoFi amidst all the banking crisis and the chaos and just all the other craziness that's going on. How much are they exposed and what exactly is the risk of that exposure? And more importantly, how is it all gonna affect SoFi as a company? And of course, we are absolutely gonna talk about how it affects the stock price. So we have a ton to discuss, so let's jump right into it. Right after you gently tap that like button and consider subscribing too. It's super easy to do if you like the truth without the hype. And we are doing better guys, but still 63% of you guys that watch my videos consistently aren't subscribed. So just make sure you click that little, you know, subscribe button down there and click the notifications bell on too. All right, guys, to be fair and upfront, I know some of you guys have watched my videos on the banking crisis. Some of you guys have missed them, unfortunately, but just to kind of, you know, set the table here, I think a lot of this banking crisis and everything else going on is completely overblown. Now, I'm not saying there's not problems. I'm not saying there's not more bank failures to come. I absolutely think there's problems and there's more bank failures to come. But in regards to the overall banking segment and the overall, you know, kind of chaos is all the banks going to go under and just all the other kind of, you know, madness and all the other narratives around it and such. I just don't see it, guys. I just don't see it as that big of a concern. And I absolutely see it as overblown. And if the bank earnings that just reported are telling you anything, it's basically that especially those mega banks, they're perfectly safe. They're putting up record profits, record, you know, revenue records across the board. You know, despite the fact that everybody, the media and everybody else telling you that somehow in high interest rate environments, they're gonna lose money, which I thought was total crap. Every time interest rates tend to go up, it's not like banks don't manage interest rate risk. They absolutely, well, except for SVB, but putting SVB aside and a few other crappy banks like that, the vast majority of them, they make money during high interest rate environments. Remember, they control the margins to spread and the more interest rates go up, the more they can increase that spread between what they're gonna pay you as a depositor and what they're gonna lend out as a lender. And they have other ways to kind of shuffle loans around, sell them off, do all kinds of other things to kind of balance that risk and of course, create more profits. Trust me, we were buying up all the big banks last, you know, I don't know what, basically September, October timeframe, whatever the case was, you know, when you could get JP Morgan almost under a hundred bucks and a whole bunch of other great banks like that. But unfortunately, SoFi is not in that mega bank category. They just don't fit, guys. They absolutely fit more into the danger zone type banking stocks and, you know, basically those type companies and such. They're not over here with the JP Morgan and such. Now that I know the CEO talked about getting there one day, but they're not there today. So we've got to put them over here in this, kind of this danger zone group and see exactly where they're at and see exactly where they're exposed. So first off, let's take a look at their initial exposure to SVB. I remember that was a big deal. It, it sent the stock down. Everybody was freaking out about it. But then when you kind of look at what they actually had exposure to, they didn't have hardly any exposure. It was just a small, you know, credit line. That was it. That's all they had exposure to SVB. So it was a non-event. Didn't affect them at all. Didn't affect their business at all. Didn't affect their ability to do business at all. And as a matter of fact, on that dip, the CEO started buying stock again, which of course is a great sign for the company itself and shows you how little exposure they had to that whole debacle that was SVB. So as the SVB debacle kind of all got worked through and you know everybody kind of figured out exactly what was going on with the company, exactly why it had problems and exactly the other banks that were you know basically exposed to the same type of risk, you saw unrealized losses started becoming the kind of key driver everybody was looking at. Hey, who has unrealized losses? How much do they have on their balance sheet and such? What are their capital that they have to offset those? Basically looking at everything that kind of comes into forming that picture and saying, hey, do we have another SVB out there? Are we seeing something like that? So let's take a look at this chart right here that basically lays out exactly that. So just for context here, you see the big banks there, JP Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they're kind of the purplish, I guess that's purple, it looks like purple to me. They're kind of the purplish banks and you can kind of see their deposits as opposed to their unrealized losses and kind of see where they fall. And, you know, basically the top right quadrant is bad. That's not where you want to be. You see exactly who's up there. That's bad. You want to be on the opposite end of the graph there. And there you go. You see SoFi. Look at how low and how far they are below all those other banks. So when you start looking at their unrealized losses versus the actual deposits, they're fine. They're, I mean, look at that. They're at 8.4 and 0.26. I mean, they are in an incredible position. They're very, very well capitalized. And to be basically honest, they're overcapitalized. And looking at JP Morgan, they're kind of considered the bellwether, right? That's where you should be. That's kind of where everybody is. And you see how they're exactly positioned right at the median and on the left side of that graph. Look at Wells Fargo, a little bit lower, just on the other side of the graph, they're still safe. And of course, Bank of America, you know, a little bit further right, but again, not in the danger zone, not in any sort of problem area or anything else like that. But you see how little risk there actually is with SoFi on this particular narrative and exactly what everybody's screaming about and basically pinning on all the midsize and small banks and such. 
SoFi just doesn't have that exposure that the other ones do. And let's look at this next chart too, basically capital and reserve to make sure they have sufficient liquidity in a stressful financial environment is kind of what this chart's showing and the higher the percentage, the more capital they have on hand. And as you can see, SVB, you can see them right there, the third one, they had virtually nothing when you consider their unrealized losses. I mean, they had nothing left. This is the reason why they essentially were out of money. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you see SoFi, unbelievable. And look, you know, compare them right there. There again, the JP Morgan and such, they are not exposed at all to a liquidity crisis whatsoever. So basically looking at this, if you consider JP Morgan to be safe and Citi and Wells Fargo and all the rest of those to be safe, Look at that chart right there and tell me how much safer is SoFi. I agree they have a more, it's definitely more volatile. There's a lot of money that's not coming out of JP Morgan and some of those other big banks, regardless of what happens. I agree there completely. But then as you kind of move down the list there and you look at smaller and smaller players to include SVB and some of the other ones that were in trouble, it's just silly to really put SoFi into the same category as those other banks because they're just not there. Very, very well capitalized. And this graphically illustrates it right there for you. So I'm sure you're asking yourself, what is the actual risk? What is the actual problem? How are they actually exposed? And to me, when I look at everything going through their financials, uh, graphically, they tried to show it, you know, without boring you by pulling up financials for the next 20 minutes. But as you work through everything, they really don't have a lot of exposure. It doesn't mean they can't have a problem somewhere. That can't mean that there's something that we, you know, can't see in the financials and in everything else that they're disclosing. But with everything that we have, and remember it is a bank, so that way it's not like we don't have access to anything here. We can absolutely see everything. There really isn't a lot of exposure. There really isn't a lot of risk associated with that. So when I look at the picture for SoFi overall, I don't know, this honestly, the concerns kind of seem to me personally, when I look at it, to not be concerns at all. But that does not mean it will not be affected by the upcoming regulation and a lot of the other, you know, basically fallout from the SVB debacle and all that other sort of stuff like that. There's going to be fallout and it's going to affect SoFi. So we need to talk about that next. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention just to kind of further show their strength, they upped everybody's FDIC deposit to $2 million on their own from the 250,000 there. You're not doing that if you have liquidity problems and you have other issues going on with your financials and such. So that's another sign of strength from SoFi. But back over to the regulation piece, which is absolutely gonna play a part in this, we all know they're going to start having higher capital requirements. They're going to start having to show more unrealized losses early. They're probably going to actually have to get audited a little bit more and have to show more data and be more compliant. And basically some of the laws that are kind of uh, imposed on the big banks and the big banks only, I think some of those regulations and those laws and such are going to start trickling down to these smaller banks like this which is gonna make it harder for the compliance departments to comply. And a lot of those banks out there that are kind of skirting the edges of the financial rules and such are definitely gonna get popped, which of course may cause more you know, pain in those smaller banks, more bank failures that might actually cause that, or may hopefully what happens is it identifies something ahead of time and then the company, the bank can course correct itself to get back in line with those policies. So in regards to regulation, it's absolutely going to hit SoFi because there's a lot of regulation they don't fall under right now that they're going to fall under into the future and it's going to slow down some of what they're doing. How big is the impact? Don't know, we'll have to wait and see what the actual regulation is. But I know in terms of capital requirements, unrealized losses, and a lot of other accounting things that have to happen and that are gonna be forced to do, I'm not concerned with SoFi at all from that standpoint. But on the flip side, despite me basically being bullish on the stock and seeing all these things as a positive and everything else, I don't think that the stock price is gonna enjoy the same rosy picture that a lot of other things that I've been talking about today are giving. So when I look at the stock price itself and I look at what Wall Street's doing, Wall Street is not interested in diving into the financials and seeing who's exposed and who's not. The traders aren't doing that. The traders are simply looking at, hey, if you're not one of the big banks over here reporting record after record after record, we're gonna hammer you. And we actually saw that the whole last year really, right? I mean, with SoFi, every quarter, it's like they get better. They become more profitable. They generate record revenue. Everything about them basically gets better and better and better, and they continue to make new plans. They pivoted from being student loan centric to, hey, that's completely cut off right now. Okay, no problem. We're gonna completely transition the bank to something different. And they successfully did that over the past year. So when I look at SoFi and I understand that Wall Street has had it wrong to me for more than a year now. Now I'm not saying it's justified to go to $25 or something like that stock price. I'm not saying it's justified to get there yet. They still need to be profitable before we see that big jump up over $10. 
you know, to basically show that, hey, they are profitable. This is a trend that's moving in the right direction there. It's still pre-profit. But when I look at the stock right now where it's at, it's also not trading fairly based upon their performance, in my opinion, of course. It's trading at a price to book like under one or something like that. I mean, it's trading really cheap. And more importantly, it's, you know, it's beaten down like they're going under, like they're one of those beaten down dogs that's losing money and they're not getting better every quarter and they don't have a plan to profitability or anything else like that. That's not how the performance dictates. That's not what the management team is saying. And so far this past year, the management team has delivered, unlike a lot of our other stocks that we love, where the management team has not delivered nearly as well as SoFi has. So I think personally, Wall Street's going to continue to stay stupid until we're kind of, until basically the regional banks have reported, until SoFi is reported, which by the way, guys, we all know when SoFi reports, it doesn't seem to matter to Wall Street all that much, whether it's good or bad. It's just like they just beat it down regardless. It runs up a little bit into it. It gets beaten down regardless. And that's what happens when your stock is this cheap right now. Traders take hold of it and they trade it and they make these sort of trades and they, they pump it up, dump it down, pump it up, dump it down. It's kind of what traders do and it kind of sucks. I agree. But if you're kind of looking long term like I do, three to five years out in regards to my timeline for SoFi, I'm very, very happy when they do that because all I got to do is be patient. Hey, they're going to control it. They're going to run it up too much. It's going to come back down and I can get shares in that four to five dollar range, which we've been able to do now for almost a year to really build out that position as they've continued to perform underneath, which is the best situation you want to be in. But I also know that as these regional banks start reporting, SoFi is going to kind of get lumped into them. Fair or not, we can argue that all day long. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that when these regional banks start to, you know, basically report and it, it goes well, okay, it may provide some relief for SoFi while people will start taking a little bit more of a serious look at it. If they don't and it's a bad, you know, those regional banks look bad, deposits are still leaving in record numbers, a lot of the commentary is very negative or very unsure of the next six months or the next quarter or whatever the case is, I suspect SoFi is going to get lumped into that and get beaten down. But again, like we just talked about, that is exactly what you want as a long-term buy and hold share investor is to kind of basically see that company just continue to truck right along. I mean, I'm assuming that they didn't have any exposure to any of this sort of stuff and they were going to report great numbers this time. And if they do, and Wall Street beats it down anyways, because, uh, you know, somehow they're tied in with the other regional banks and some of the other smaller banks and such. Well, okay, that's to your advantage as an investor. It means you can pick up shares on the cheap. It's not like this is going to go on forever. It's not like, oh, it's just a dead stock for the next 10 years. It's not going to be the case. Well, I mean, once they turn that profitability switch, wait and see where that stock goes from there. I think it's going to be a nice ride up. Now, it's not going to rocket to 25, 2020 is over with, 2021. You know, that whole craziness is all over with. So don't go expecting that. But you can absolutely expect that maybe it creates a solid base. Maybe we never see that $4 range again. Again, I'm not really here to make predictions. I just know if they're performing and Wall Street wants to get stupid and beat it down to $4, awesome. I'm happy to buy. But in the meantime, I'm looking at is the business performing or not? And what is going on with SoFi? What is going on in this banking crisis? What do their financials tell us? What is the management team telling us? And everything to me looks like, hey, they're doing exactly what they need to do as an institution to move this thing forward. So I'm not concerned with SoFi at all. I've happily been adding this entire time and the fours and the fives, and I'm gonna continue to add and build out this position if this quarter comes along and it's another banging quarter and Wall Street just decides to get stupid again. And remember to check out my group if you wanna see my buys on SoFi in real time, if you wanna see my watch list with price targets, you wanna take five courses for free, talk to me, you know, slide into my DMs, or we do live Q and A's at least weekly, sometimes more. We got all kinds of materials in there, videos for you to explore. We also have the best Discord community of six and seven figure investors out there helping everyone to include. We got a lot of guys in there just uh, SoFi's life. They buy SoFi and they're into it. They're intimate into it. You know, I'm pretty sure they, they drive by the CEO's house or something. I don't know. They seem to know a whole heck of a lot of what's going on with SoFi. So anyways, check out the pinned comment down there if you're interested and click this video here if you want to see the three stocks that I'm buying now and click here if you want to see exactly my plan for this market. So thanks for watching. And we'll see you in the next one.